I just want to first say thank you so much for taking the time out to speak with me um, and to just help me as I like, I don't know, I started a family project and it's turned into something deeper. And I'm just yes. like, wow, I'm just blown away by so many things. Um, so much history there. Yeah, so much history. And so I know you're a busy man. So I just want to thank you for taking the time out to talk to me. So I do want to just hop right in. And the first thing I want to know from you is because I just want to get some context. Um, could you walk me through the first time that you met my great grandfather, um, John Moses Bonner? I met him at a uh, farm meeting that we organized early on in, in the Black Farmers Movement, uh, probably in the early 90s, uh, when I first met uh, Mr. Bonner. And I've always called him Mr. Bonner. And uh, I met him at a uh, farm meeting for Black farmers uh, that we organized with Linwood Brown, mm -hmm. who is from Warfield, Virginia. And there was another gentleman, uh, a local Black farmer there that Mr. Bonner was friends with. Uh, so I met him there in Dinwiddie, Virginia, at a, at a uh, farmer's farm. Uh, matter of fact, at there, uh, the Bonner family farm is where I met him. And there was other farmers that came to the farm, uh, uh, to that area meeting. And, uh, you know, he, he had a, a great, wonderful wisdom spirit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about him, uh, very humble, uh, knowledgeable, and was a real advisor to me very early on in the black farmers, uh, uh, movement. And there, there was a, a whole lot of facets to the, the black farmers movement we had. Uh, rallies and protests and meetings and cookouts. And we met at uh, we, nothing fancy at a farmer's farm, like Mr. Bonner's farm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he, he became a, a very good friend uh, and an organizer. Uh, so he was like the organizer for, for Dinwiddie, Virginia. And the other farmers had so much respect uh, for Mr. Bonner, you know, the way he carried himself, humble, knowledgeable uh, man, you know, you, he kept me out of trouble because he would always say, hey, boy, you know, uh, yeah, say this, but, but don't do that, you know? Yeah, and I find it so interesting because, you know, I am super close with my Uncle Lester and Uncle Bubba, you know, and when I was a kid, it was just normal to me to see them, you know, my dad out there helping them raise hogs yes. and stuff. And I, as a kid, it was annoying because, you know, I'm a kid. I was like, I don't want to be out here and That's doing right. this. It's so boring. But right. I find it so interesting because I was doing my research and I literally typed in um, Black farmers in Dinwiddie, Virginia. And it was mind blowing to me that within the first five hits on Google, there was my grandpa Moses name. And I was like blown away. And I remember vividly because again, I was in high school when he passed. So I remember him being like a gentle giant. So when I talked to my, my Nana is Sharon, mm -hmm. the baby girl. Um, yeah. And so when I talked to her, I'm like, wait a minute, Nana, like I had no clue you know, I knew CNN came to the, you know, had coverage yeah, at the funeral. Yeah, I and she was like, her. well, you know, doctor, yeah, she said, you know, Dr. Boyd spoke at the funeral. Yeah. And so I was doing my research and I found out like in 1910 that um, there was a huge height in black owner land ownership. So yes. there were 16 million acres of farmland. It was owned and cultivated by black families. Um, yeah. And so that was 14% total. Today is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the history of, uh, and, and those numbers uh, are, are reflective uh, uh, today. Uh, because uh, if you look at uh, your, your family is a great example of uh, what, what black farming looked like, uh, you know, in America. So if you've seen your family farm, uh, that's what we did. We had a few head of beef cattle. We had some hogs. We we raised hay and, and, and peanuts and tobacco and soybeans and corn. We are great farmers. Uh, so it wasn't uh, the fact that we were bad farmers while we're not in business. It was the federal government that done a number on uh, black farmers through uh, programs like the lease back, buyback program, uh, where they 
if we were lucky enough to receive a farm operating loan, almost all of us had, uh, you know, a supervised bank account. That means that the person from USDA, uh, we, it used to be called Farmers Home Administration when we first began to organize. Uh, Farmers Home Administration would have to sign the checks for oh, Black wow. farmers. And for white farmers, they were issued a operating check from the government to deposit into their account. And we had to open up account through the government where the uh, county supervisor, i.e. The, the white man would have to sign this, this check for, for us to buy things such as seed and lime and fertilizer. And many white farmers don't see that as discrimination, but it is. Yeah, so absolutely. When you, when you issue a check to a white farm family and said, you know, oh, well, you can you manage your money, but for black farmers, you guys can't manage your money. We're going to have to sign a check for you. Uh, so when you when you look at this thing, your family is the ideal family and what uh, you would see around the South. You can take the Bonner family and you can put it in Georgia. You can put it in uh, Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama, and it will look virtually the same as far as the makeup and what we did and, and how we did it. And uh, we, we were good farmers, like Mr. Bonner was a great farmer. And, and look at all the skill sets he passed on to uh, John and Lester. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he taught him how to cook. He taught him how to uh, a butcher and slaughter a hog and cow and uh, and to make barbecue and and and, uh, and good eat barbecue. That. Yes, the best. And this and this, you know, bunch are still that. I mean, you can't taste anything any better. Th these are arts and skills of the black farmer that has been passed down through generational knowledge. Uh, so Mr. Bonner passed down the art and skill of farming and all of the things that intricate details that come with that you know, skill set. Uh, so you hear people right now say, oh, well, I'm going to go out, Mr. Boyd, tomorrow and be a farmer. Well, <clears throat> it's a great idea, but there's an art to farm and there's a skill set to farm. There's knowledge and wisdom that uh, you need to partner up with the older farmer and learn all of these skill sets. So John and Lester had a great teacher. Yeah. And I'm just thankful that I got to spend the time with Mr. Bonner that I did as a as a very young leader. So he helped. What you see here, I'm a product too of Mr. Bonner through his uh, mentoring, very quiet mentoring. That's what a, a lot of young people are missing now. Uh, that yeah. older generation with knowledge and wisdom. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you brought that up because I'm actually, I got this book, Farming While Black. Yes. Um, and so I started reading this and, you know, just learning about how the land is healing, how you have to allow the land to talk to you. Um, you know, not just jumping and rushing into things. Um, my uncle Bubba said something so key. He was like, you know, farming was just a way of life. It was a means of survival for our family. And so because it was a means of survival and you know, I can't wrap my head around the fact that the percentage, well, I can't wrap my head around why um, uh, the percentage of farmers have dwindled. I want to know, how do you think America has spelled Black farmers time and time again? Here's what uh, a lot of uh, the younger generation can't, can't get their arms around. Uh, the fact that uh, they can't see themselves as farmers, that's the first thing and they can't see themselves coming from the farm, the second thing, all, all of which is incorrect. Uh, we're all one to two generations away from somebody's farm. If you look at your family, there was a farmer in there somewhere, uh, one or two generations down the, the family tree. Uh, so if you're a black person with 60% uh, 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 DNA black, and the other <laughs> three probably is white, but you came from the farm. And uh, you came from somebody's farm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether we wanted to be from there or not. And what happened was uh, two things happened. One, there was a, a bad taste in our mouths for farming because of slavery, uh, because of sharecropping, because of Jim Crow and the struggles that we faced after the, the Civil War. So uh, many white farm families sold this land after the Civil War 
but we didn't have any real monies to farm the land. So we still were at the mercy of many white farm families to help us buy seed and fertilizer. So although that black farm family owned the land, they had some sort of relationship with some white family or some white uh, general merchandise store in that community uh, in, in, order to, in order to survive. So after that, uh, you had what was called in the, the 50s and 60s, the great migration up north, where many blacks said, you know what? I can do better than the farm. I want to move away and so on and so forth. So you had that percentage of blacks leaving the farm. And then you had the remaining blacks who got tied up with the United States Department of Agriculture, the lender of last resorts. And they had uh, for a long time was called black extension agents uh, that would work with uh, a lot of the black farmers and a lot of the black sharecroppers to help get them smaller uh, farm operating loans. When the government done away with the black extension service, uh, six in one hand, half a dozen in another, I believe it hurt because then we were integrated into a system that totally didn't want us. Yeah. Which was the, you know, uh, it changed its name in, in 1994 to Farm Service uh, Agency. So it changed from Farmers Home Administration to Farm Service Agency, but it didn't change the way that it dealt with black people. Yeah. Uh, continued to, for poor processing time, for example, uh, 387 days in, uh, in the county I live in and to process a black farm loan request in less than 30 days to process a white farm loan request. Uh, 157 loans were made uh, to farmers and only two were black. Mm -hmm. uh, and that person was a minority advisor to the committee. Uh, so very, very wide dis disparate figures uh, that USDA uh, were doing. And, and, and uh, early on in the 80s and 90s, they would come out and tell you, well, I ain't got no money you know, to lend to you. Uh, so there was a, uh, uh, a force such as uh, deterring black farmers from even applying. Uh, that happened all, all throughout the South. And the way that they spoke to us and treated us, uh, it made it difficult for a humble black farmer to even want to do business with the USDA uh, mm. because of our old black pride, you know, uh, such as Mr. Bonner, very quiet man, but very proud, dignified. And you can see that in the way he carried himself. Uh, so that's not the guy who, who wants to run into the office and get the door slammed in his face. That's, that's just not our style. Yeah, and Grandpa Moses was a pioneer for the Black Farmers um, Movement. Yes. And so I wanted to talk about like his role um, in the Black Farmers Movement just a little bit. Um, like, I know you Don't guys went and bucks. marched in, in North Carolina. You know, you've well, done a great deal of things. Well, I'm gonna tell you, uh, a great organizer, community organizer, and and the Dinwiddie stop, but they, we would organize by buses uh, mm. to go to these marches and the marches would be at the White House, at the Department of Agriculture, at Congress, at the Department of Justice. These are all uh, areas of the government and the United States Department of Agriculture so many times I can't count. But, uh, uh, and we would organize and there were stops along the way. So Mr. Bonner was the Dinwiddie stop and everybody there was organized by Mr. Bonner. So, and most of the time, there were two largest pickups. One was in Warfield, Virginia, and Dinwiddie, Virginia was the two biggest stops on the uh, 85 corridor. So we would have buses coming from 85 heading to Washington and 95 heading from Washington. And, uh, and Mr. Bonner was, was the was a Dinwiddie organizer, and he was always first on the bus in, in Dinwiddie. Uh, so he was he was fired up, he was ready, and uh, you know you could count on his leadership, you know, for that part of the country. And quite frankly, I miss him there. Uh, you know, John and Lester, uh, those are my boys, you know, and I, and I love them. But I deeply miss Mr. Bonner because I had a deep relationship with him. Uh, that I, you know, really relied on his confidence and, and his his quiet advice uh, and the enormous amount of respect that I had for him. Uh, so uh, he's 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 part of my family and and the Bonner family uh, 
uh, through his tree. You know, Mr. Mr. Bonner has a tree. Yes, Lester, mm -hmm. his job. Uh, Professor Alice Bonner yeah. has been my uh, editor probably for 10 years. So all of the writings that you see uh, on my op-eds and blogs, uh, again, touched by the Bonner family because Alice, Professor Alice Bonner's uh, pen is in that writing, in, in those writings. Uh, so you guys have done a whole lot in the movement and I hope that this thing goes widespread uh, to see that the National Black Farmers Association had some, some kick behind people like Mr. Bonner uh, that really uh, helped pave the way uh, for the largest settlement thus far in history for black people, which is the black farmer settlement. So he yeah. played a tremendous role in that. And, and I hope that people will watch this. Uh, people see my face, but, but they never saw the people that was whispering in my ear, uh, yeah. such, as, such as John Bonner and, and the Bonner family. Yeah, and I love that you said that because I know that at his funeral, you said um, the issue is black farmers don't have their money. That's the bottom line. Um, and you spoke about that, about the passing of my great grandfather, right. you know, because he didn't receive, he, he died waiting, you know, that my, and, and that's, uh, you know, so we, we have a bill today, uh, that probably will pass and, and it's, uh, partly so of, of leaders like John Bonner too, yeah. uh, because they're, you know, when we first started out, I'll be honest with you, I couldn't find the word black farmer in print almost anywhere until, you know, we, we organized here. Uh, so the movement started here. It started in, in Brunswick and Dinwiddie County, uh, Virginia, and it, it went national. So the organizing that we were able to do here locally, uh, you know, it's, it's not told in the, the whole national scope of same things and now you see you see black farmer everywhere and everybody yeah. everybody wants in uh but they never once and stop and recognize the names and the faces and the pain and the suffering and the time yeah. and all of these things that went into the movement and sometimes you got to stop and say thank you to the people that played a role there mm -hmm. and that's that's why i was at i was at his funeral yeah uh, you know, I uh, said, so I'm going to be there and, and somebody going to give me more than five minutes. I ain't even hearing that <laughs> because, you know, his, his life body of work, you know, uh, to me, uh, was was part of, of the movement. And like I said, uh, this movement led to the, the largest settlement in, uh, in history. And now your generation knows about Black Lives Matter. Yeah. But before Black Lives Matter, there was the black farmer movement, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. with a mule and a tractor, you know, Mr. And Mr. Bonner would, you know, would help me with the mule because he knew what to do, you know? Yeah. Uh, because he was raised with one. Uh, so he was one of the few people on the bus that, that knew all that stuff, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm a person, obviously, because I come from the Bonners, I am very much um, into my faith. So I know that divine timing is everything. I talked to my dad. I've been calling him like almost every day because as a kid, I was always inquisitive. So I was that kid that liked to write. I liked to know everything that was going on. And it kind of bled into my childhood. And when I went to college, I was like, you know what? I'm going to make a career out of writing and talking about Black people because that's what I'm passionate about. I tell you, uh, if you got if you got any pen like Professor Bonnie, you you're gonna be you're gonna be a hell of a writer because man, that lady can write. She she has yes. a gift of writing. Yes, she yeah. certainly she she's she certainly does. And I was talking to my dad because I didn't even realize that for me, I'm the descendant of farming on both sides of my family. Wow. So the Yates, my um, my yeah. dad is a Yates, yeah. Yeah. and then the Bonners. And, you know, when I did the story, I actually went to the farm and where it connected between both of my family, you know, both sides of my family. And I've always found it very interesting that the Yates side, they kind of did away with the farming um, right. after a while. And I just want to know from you, what do you feel like a fully supportive um, USDA looks like for Black farmers at large? 
it looks like a uh, uh, on a national scale and for black farmers at large, a USDA should look like they are open for business for black people. Yeah. This stuff about, uh, you know, uh, you have the ex agriculture secretary up top. And right now, uh, because of all of the heightened uh, uh, media attention uh, that we're getting now towards the black farmer issue, uh, Secretary Vilsack is saying all the right things. Uh, quite frankly, doesn't have a choice, you know, the yeah. Washington Post, New York Times, uh, all of the national media, CBS, all, everybody's done something on this. But if it doesn't trickle down to the local offices where the Bonner brothers can walk into their local office in Dinwiddie, Virginia, and feel like they want to give them service, mm -hmm. then all the work is in vain. So a USDA should be open for business for Blacks. Uh, process their loans like you do anybody else. Uh, make sure that we receive the monies when the monies come down the pike, like everybody else. Uh, that's what that's what USDA should look like. And quite frankly, they should have people in there that look like me and you. Yeah. Uh, you can't have a local office and it be Lily White, and then you say, well, oh well, we're not discriminating. Mm -hmm. The problem with discrimination is you can't define discrimination for me as white America. You can't say, well, oh, that's not discrimination to me. That's just this. That's not up to you. It's up to me yeah. to decide what discrimination looks like, feels like, and is for me. Not, not, not white America, not USDA, not some in investigative service. Uh, when you walk into the office and you don't treat me like with dignity and respect and you talk downward towards me and you're looking at me like what in the Sam world is this man doing in here? Mm -hmm. People, that's what discrimination is. I've seen them walk into the office. I've seen white people walk into the office and they greet them with a big smile and, and they, they're talking to them. They ask them about mm -hmm. their families and they look at you like, oh my God, what are you doing in here? Uh, so a USDA should be open for business. It should have people of color. It should have blacks in there. And I'm going to say this, the right blacks that want to do something for their, their people and make sure that their people are getting treated with dignity and respect. Uh, just because there's a black face uh, doesn't mean all the time that that black person wants to do what's right for their people. So it yeah, has to all be skin great. folk ain't so, kin folk. There you go. There you go. We'll say that again. And I hope <laughs> the young people can grasp that because I've been saying it in my interviews, you know? Uh, they said, well, we hired somebody black. Was it the right black? What yeah. is it the right black that's going to say, Secretary Vilsack, you know what? It's wrong for you to do that. Or, it's, it's, or you're not saying this right or you're not doing this right. Is it that kind of black that's going to push back for fairness and justice for, the, for his people? Or the kind of black person that's at the table with his mouth closed looking one way? There's mm -hmm. a big difference, people. So yeah. I'm gonna go on record saying I'm, I'm not putting down my people, but I believe that it has to be the right person of color uh, that wants to push for justice on the inside. Yeah, and I love that. And so my last question for you is just, I wanna know what are your hopes for the future of black farmers? And in what ways um, can we encourage more youth to get involved? I know you well, explained that they need to listen to the elders but yeah. how can we encourage them to, to even get started? I think that, uh, first of all, if we could get more want, want to from the younger generation, and I, I think it's, it's, it's beautiful in more than one way is that you are doing this uh, piece. And uh, I think it's even better that you're showing interest and want to learn the next steps about number one, your family, and number two, what, what farming is and what it's like. We need more young people to take the same exact steps that you are doing. Because every, and I explained it earlier, every black person in this country, if they look back on one side of the family or the other, has some sort of connection to the land and, yeah. and the farm. And I have, uh, you know, I have 
after two boys and a biological son and a stepson. And neither one really wants to be a farmer. I said, okay, if you don't want to be a farmer, then understand what land ownership is. Yeah. And what you could still do with the land to, to make money and also, you know, build a home and raise your family and, and do all the things that come along with uh, land ownership. Every step you take, every step you make requires land. And my grandfather, Thomas Board, would say, you could either be on your own or you can be trespassing on someone else. So it's about the land and the land never mistreated anybody. People do. That's what my grandfather said. It never discriminated against him. Uh, the land, if he put down the right amount of lime and fertilizer and seed, my grandfather said, I can produce just as good as crop as anybody. Yeah. Uh, so it's the people that have been doing the discrimination. But I want more young people to look at this and say, hey, what can I do to be a farmer? And there's all types of uh, programs uh, at USDA that I want more young uh, Blacks to get involved in. There's a big beginning farmer program there. There's farm, oper farm operating loans, farm ownership loans, farm equipment loans, rural development loans. So if you don't want to be a farmer, then you can borrow money from uh, rural development and build a small house. Uh, so there's things that you can do to stay in rural communities and make it and, uh, and, and live a cheaper basic uh, lifestyle. So I don't want black people to turn turn a blind eye away from rural America. Yeah. Go back and find your roots, that's the first thing, just, just the way that you're doing, and then decide what facet of farming or land ownership would you like to be involved in? I understand everybody's not gonna be a farmer, but everybody, if you can afford a new car, you can afford five acres in the country. Uh, that's my motto. So, Buy some land for the young people and, and start there and start small. You can you can start with a garden in your backyard and and get a feel for it for, for the skill set and kind of grow from there. So you don't have to be a large scale production farmer like me tomorrow. Take your time, take take baby steps and mentor up with a older black farmer, such as the Bonner brothers, John and Lester Bonner. Hang around them, learn the skill set, learn the art and find out what avenue you want to take in that farming operation and then focus on it. That's the perfect point to end on because I myself, like literally, I called my dad last night and I was like, yeah, like I'm trying to come out there this summer and I want to, uh, I was like, tell me what, what do I need to do? But I just know now I, I would love to use you and my uncles as a resource because I, my dream would be to have a little tiny house that I can escape to with my oh. own garden. Wrong with that? And, and uh, I see that as a win uh, for me and my light body work and for your grandfather and, his, and the Bonner brothers and their light body work. We all count that as a win because you come back to the land and you say, listen, I, I just want to have a house in a small garden. For me, that's, that's a win. That's that's still that's still a farmer, and, and you're living in rural and rural community, and you're reconnecting with your roots, yeah, your history, and uh, you know how you spell history, his, his story. story, yeah. So you can't rely on other people to tell the Bonner story. Mm -hmm. uh, the the only people that can can tell it right and tell it tell it good is you. And uh, you know, right now you're a journalist, and and I believe that this is the way God want to use you right now to tell this story, and and to and, and to use this story for 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 Mr. Bonner and and his two sons and the and the whole Bonner family to tap the minds of younger people. Uh, okay. So God is using you right now uh, to do that to tell that story because yes, I've been telling it. But now it's being told through the eyes of a of a actually family member of the Bonner family. So uh, that that brings chill bumps for me because that means guess what, John, John Boyd, you win too because those, <laughs> yeah. those, those are people that I spent so many days with, you know, organizing. And uh, I can tell you firsthand uh, when I met Mr. Mr. Bonner, you know, 30 years ago, I didn't think I would still be doing this kind of work. In, yeah. in 2021. 
uh, I it just no, you know, I thought we would get a settlement and I would come back to the farm and and live happily ever after. And this it's become a movement and something I believe is going to be written for the history books. Absolutely. I'm, I'm hoping that John Bonner name ends up somewhere in, in that dialogue too of uh, one of the pioneers and the black farmer movement because this was a movement. Thank you. And before I let you go, I wanted to share something really cool with you that I uncovered in my research. But I found out that the house that my uh, grandpa Moses and my grandma law um, raised my Nana and all of her siblings in, it was actually built before the Revolutionary War. So, so, and I was like, wow, like, again, I'm a very spiritual person. So I was like, hmm, that is not lost on me that this is such a revolutionary family. Because, yeah. you know, I have my great grandpa who started this movement, but I like for me, the person that I always saw is my Nana because she integrated schools in the county. You know, she tells me about all the times that kids spit on her, teachers weren't kind to her, you know, and then she doubled back and became director of secondary education, you know, yeah. so um, I just wanted to share that with you. And that's I just want to say thank you for keeping well, my grand. That's a part of history, too. Uh, that's, yeah. a, you know, that little, that little fact right there, you know, and it, it shows that, uh, you know, even before we were free, we, 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 you know, we were fighting to be free. That's a matter of fact there, you know, the fact that the house was there, you're out there trying to make it and trying to, you know, do these things, even with, you know, Jim Crow and and, and, and slave laws and all kinds of stuff hanging over your head. Um, again, that's where, that's where white America misses it uh, with black history. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've we've uh, been uh, treated egregious uh, in this country uh, for a very long time and the fact you know, that we're getting ready to get a little justice in this bill, you know, is making them go nuts. Uh, yeah. but look at, look at uh, four or 500 years of, of uh, mistreatment here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so you have to, you have to play the whole deck of cards, not just pull one, one card out the deck and say, this is everything. Uh, exactly. that's my to, to white America, understand race, understand discrimination, and then judge me. Uh, that's, that's my challenge to white America. Uh, don't look at me as a big burly black man with a deep voice and and uh, polarizing, intimidating figure. Don't don't look at me that way. Judge me for what comes out of my mouth and judge me for my character Absolutely. and the way that I live every day. That's that's the way I and that's what Mr. Bond would want. I can tell you right now. Yeah. Uh, start to speak through me right there, and I believe <laughs> he would want the exact same the exact same thing, you know, Absolutely. Treat him based on his character and his, his life body of the work and the way he lived uh, was exemplary in, in his, in his community. Uh, you can speak to anybody about John Bonner and you don't hear anything bad. Yeah. It tells you the character uh, and the life body of work and how that person lived and contributed to their local community people. When you exactly. ask anybody in there, it's oh man, I know he was, that was that was a good guy. That's what you want people to say about you, uh, not not all of these things that they say we are in the media. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to hear more about people like John Bonner. Absolutely, and thank you again, again, just for keeping his spirit alive through yes. your work. And I look yes. forward to working with you in the future to just thank continue you. and to have his name everywhere. Because best believe, I am definitely that is the goal. And it's just to encourage others that we have history in the back, you know, in the backyard of our families. The, I love the big names like Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, but we have so many small, fearless leaders that that get tossed well, to the side or not heard that's, of. That's why I was trying to make the comparison. Uh, everybody in, in your generation and right now that watches uh, any type of media heard about Black Lives Matter. But very few people know about the Black Farmers Movement. And we actually are the first test case for reparations in this country because we received the largest settlement in history so far for, for Black people, which, which is a uh, Black Farmers uh, altogether about $2.5 uh, billion. Yeah. Uh, and a whole lot of people didn't get their money, but some did. And it's still the largest settlement in history. 
and black people really need to study uh, the black farmers movement a ragtag group from Virginia and Dinwiddie and Brunswick uh, took on the government and won. Absolutely. Everybody didn't win. But from a holistic standpoint, you know, we, we David and Goliath, we, we knocked the big guy down for a few minutes anyway. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. I will talk to you later and we'll keep in touch. I love the Bonner family. Make sure that clip gets in there. <laughs> I will. Wonderful, beautiful people.